Hello, everybody. This is Lauren Hershey. I'm the senior pastor at Word of Life Church, and we hope this podcast blesses you and helps bring you closer to God. Enjoy today's message. Glory to God. What a wonderful day. Channel 7 says it's a classic fall day. (laughs) So what a wonderful day to be together in the Lord. We started a, a, a really A message last week. It's going to take about four weeks, uh, Lord willing, to help us get it out. We're talking about how to receive anything. How to receive anything. And so, Mark chapter 9, verse 23, says this. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Can you say all things? All things are possible to him that believes. All things. Staggers our thoughts, drenches our thinking. But this, so we want to get involved in believing, right? Well, five of us do. So we want to get involved in believing, right? Yeah, because there's things out there for you out there for you, that God wants for you, that will come to you through your process of believing. Say it with me. All things are possible to him who believes. Look with me at Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus looked at them, the disciples, and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. There's nothing impossible with God. So all things are possible to him that believes. With God, all things are possible. Glory be to God. That means that it is possible for God to get involved in your finances and turn things around or lift you to a new level. It's possible. It's possible for him to turn things around. We see it in the scriptures. That in a day he turned things around. For for the people of God who were, they were being sieged, besieged. And people were starving inside the city walls. In the next day, by the next day, there was abundant provision for everybody. Everybody was gathering up the spoil and carrying it back home, feasting and having a great time. In one day, it's possible. It's possible for God to penetrate your body. The God that made your body is able to penetrate your body and restore it to health. Glory to God. He can fix it. He made it. He can fix it. I saw a Honda commercial on TV last night that in the future, your old Honda can be made into a new Honda. There's, you know, how computer graphics go. I mean, the old parts, the old body was just floating off of it, and new parts were coming on, and the new body was coming on. Woo! Glory to God. That's a good deal. (laughs) Good deal that the God that made your body to take out the stuff that's broken and put in new stuff. Oh, hallelujah. Restore you to health. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 40, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They're young. They'll, they'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. They'll renew their strength. Oh, hallelujah. We, we, glory to God. That's, how many of you would pray with me and believe God with me for utterance this morning? For the Holy Spirit to help me speak. It's my desire, the very depth of my, it's my desire to that he would speak through me. The words that come out of this mouth will be his words talking to you. So can we ask him for that? How many believe he'll give that if we ask? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you for utterance this morning. I ask you, Father, to bring to my remembrance those things that you have spoken to me. Help me to recall them. Help me to communicate your word, Father, this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're talking about how to receive anything, anything, because true Christianity is a relationship with a living God 
who hears and answers prayer. I'm going to say that again. True Christianity is a relationship with a living God who hears and answers prayer. Come on, Stephanie. It's so good to see you this morning. I just can't. Hallelujah. The big gone. Oh, glory to God. Okay, back to the message. Little commercial there. You know, it's been shown that if we do take a commercial now and then in the midst of the message, you know, about every six or seven minutes that when we come back to the message, people pay more attention. You know, so you wonder sometimes why pastors and pe- preachers throw a joke in now and then. I mean, as a kid, when I was sitting at a denominational church, you know, it, it, that's when I would perk up. When everybody started laughing, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> you know, kind of like going to a football game, doing something else, and something happens, you look for the replay. Amen. God can do anything. He can do anything. And if, you, if you'll believe, you can receive. If you believe, you can receive. Now, what do, look with me at Matthew chapter 7, and let's, let's, let's review for just a, a minute or two. Or that would be a lie if I said that, uh, a minute or two. It's probably going to be a few more than that. You say, why? Well, because repetition is the mother of, and motor of learning. Just because you heard it once doesn't mean that you've got it. I know that because when people ask me on Saturday what the message was the previous Sunday, I have to stop and think about it. And I'm the guy that preached it. <laughs> you know, so just because you heard it one time doesn't mean that you got it. And besides that, there's people who are here that weren't here last week. Amen. And so Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Man, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. So asking is important, but I want us to understand asking is not step one. What is step one? Something comes before the asking. And we, we spent some time with this last week. Step one is understanding what the will of the Lord is. Then until you understand what the will of the Lord is, you're not ready to ask. Go with me to Matthew 6. Let's back up to Matthew 6, verse 5. Jesus is teaching us how to pray, teaching his disciples how to pray. Matthew 6, 5, he says, And when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. True, uh, surely I say to you, they have their reward. So he said, don't be praying like them, just out there to make a show. He said, they do that just to be seen, and they've got everything they're going to get. They were seen, and that's it. But when you pray, he says, go into your closet, into your room, And when you shut the door, pray to your father who's in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So right here, let's catch this right here. We get a hint. This is a relationship. It's something that is personal and private and real between you and another individual, between you and God, not any other human being. Then he goes on and says in verse 7, And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. In other words, for us, so this morning, I want us to catch the character, the character that he's bringing out about this relationship with the Lord. He said, pray in private, not in public. Nothing wrong with public prayer, unless you're doing it to be seen of men. There's times you pray in public. But he's bringing out there the intimacy and the reality of the relationship, the privacy of it. And that if you do it in secret, your father's going to reward you openly. And then it says, but don't, and when you pray, don't say the same thing again and again and again, thinking that you'll be heard just because you talk a lot. It's not a matter of talking a lot. It's not a matter of saying the same thing over and over again. He said, but when you pray, therefore, don't be like them. For your father, catch this in verse 7, don't be like them. For your father knows what things you have need of 
before you ask him. Now, let's set this in the right place. Understand who we're talking about. We're talking about you're going to talk to your heavenly father, and he's a good father. Okay, he's not an evil father. He's not an egotist. He's not a sadist. He's not an ego trip or a control trip. He's not a control freak. You're not here to give him, to give him, oh, well, how can I say that, Lord? He's not interested in watching you squirm. He's not, he's not going to do things to put you through mental and emotional gymnastics so he gets goody out of it. He's not, he's not emotionally dysfunctional. He's not messed up. God's not messed up. He's sound-minded. He's healthy. Okay, God is healthy. And he's your father. And he's a good father. Matter of fact, another verse says another place, and we'll, we'll likely go there, that, well, let me see if we can find it right here in Matthew 7, verse 11. If you then being evil, let's back up a little bit. Let's read on, verse 9 through 11. Or what man is, is there among you who are... It, who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Can we catch what he's saying? Those answers are there. For, if a good, if a, a, like someone said, even the mafia knows how to give good gifts to their children. So he said, in verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, can you say how much more? How much more will your father give, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. Go back over to, to chapter 6. Our Father, he said. You don't have to pray over and over again trying to twist his arm, trying to talk him into something. Your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. Yet he still wants you to ask. Can you say that after me? He still wants me to ask. The title of this message is, How to Receive Anything. Part 2, Ask. <laughs> ask. He knows what, the, he's got a good heart toward you. He, he, he knows you have these things. And like last week we said, you need to know you, you need these things. Well, I, maybe, I guess I don't, I, I may not need it. Well, the Father knows you do need it. Well, maybe he's holding this back. Maybe he wants me to learn something through this, this suffering I'm going through. No, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 1 says, I shall not want. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of being and doing right, and all these things will be added to you. Stop it. Stop that re with that religious thinking that says, well, I may not, maybe I don't need this. Maybe I don't, I don't have to have this. I grew up in a church like that. I grew up in a community like that. Like the one with the most, the biggest humble button was the one who could stand up and say, well, I can live with the least. That's not biblical. You remember what we learned from Luke chapter 10? The man came up and said, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself. And the man said, who's my neighbor? Trying to get out of it. He was a lawyer trying to find a loophole. And Jesus taught him about the good Samaritan. How religion couldn't help the guy that was stripped Robbed, left half dead. But the good Samaritan came by, poured in oil and wine, ministered to him, took him to an inn and paid the bill and said, when I come back, if there's anything is more owed, I'll take care of that too. Who is our good Samaritan? It's Jesus. Jesus who found us 
stripped of our glory, who found us dead on the inside, who found us broken and broke, and he redeemed us, and he's coming back, praise the Lord. We know the grace. Now, you may think, if you're thinking that, well, he's just talking about money. I'm not talking about just money, but I am talking about money. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be rich. More than enough. That good Samaritan had more than enough. Can you say more than enough? He had more than enough so he could take care of somebody else. This is prosperity with a purpose. Okay, not selfishness. It's not greed. It's not covetousness. But it's also not that fake humility that says, I don't need anything else. Well, what about the guy down the street? What about the folks that called us this week or are living in their car? Calling the body of Christ, hoping to gain some help. We need more than enough, right, in order so we have something to help them. So, so stop it. Stop with this religious thinking, this quirky stuff that says, well, I don't need it. Stop thinking about only yourself. All right, let's get back to the message. <laughs> that is part of it. It's part of it, right? Your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And what you have need of is not just all your needs being met. What you have need of is reserves for somebody else. Proverbs says there's treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But the foolish man spends it all up. What's that mean? It's that you have reserves in your house. That when somebody comes knocking on your door in the middle of the night, you've got something in the freezer. You've got something in the cabinet. I remember talking with one of the older ladies in the church years ago. And we were talking about somehow there was some speakers or somebody here. We were talking about coming out to their place for, it was kind of a short, short notice lunch. And she goes, oh, that's fine. I'll just pull a lasagna out of the freezer. She had all kinds of casseroles and stuff ready made up just in the freezer. Just ready. When the occasion arose. Now, you might think that that's just normal. Depending on how you're raised, the standard of living you lived at. But I'm telling you, for the majority of the world, she's rich. And, and I was relating you to the, this morning where we were at financially years ago. And the, it's the Lord that's brought us to a different place. We had to make the decision along the way to, you know, like one guy said, if your outcome exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Do I need to say that slower? If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. We had to, I had to come to the point of, of, of looking at, if I just pay the minimum, minimum payment on this credit card, I'm going to pay back what? <laughs> and start rolling the balances over onto zero interest credit cards and taking steps. Thank God we're not there now. You know, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said this. If you get a man saved, you can't keep him poor. Because if he starts to, if he applies the principles God gives him, he will accumulate. And it's so true. So when we say Jesus is the answer for people, he is the anointed Word of God. The Word of God that comes into your heart. The Word of God that He speaks to you. That light, that truth. That aha, that I see it. That it comes on and direction comes. There's life in it. There's hope in it. Sometimes there's correction in it. 
But it's a good thing. Amen? Amen. We're talking about how to receive anything. Don't be repetitious. Be in a relationship. For your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask Him. Therefore, Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glory, holy are you. Lifted up, exalted, supreme, sovereign, reverend, extolled are you. Our Father who art in heaven, our Father, not just God. Listen, he's God to the world, but he's Father to his kids. And again, he's a good, good Father. And if you had a good Father and you've got a You've experienced God as a good heavenly father. Please share that with other people. Because a lot of us in this room didn't have that experience. And your testimony along with the word of God will help wash that negative experience out of people's hearts. And help them come to embrace God their father as he really is. Because when you know him, you're going to love him. He's good. Can I get an amen, church? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And and I want you to understand the, the tone of that. Give us this day. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's not a, oh, God, would you give us this day? No, scholars will tell you the sense of the language in the original language is give us our bread now. Give us our bread now. See, it, your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. He wants you to ask And he wants you to ask without qualms. Qualms is a word that means misgivings, doubts, worries about your conduct or your relationship. Uh, The dictionary would define qualms. It would use a little line that says, says this, that military regimes have no qualms about stifling communication, about controlling the media. Hamas had no qualms about invading Israel. No misgivings, no second thoughts, no doubts, no wobbling. God wants you to come to him and receive without qualms. He's your heavenly father. So asking is important, but asking doesn't come first. What comes first is, is affirming and focusing on His will. You see that? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then ask, give us this day. So asking is important, but asking's not number one. Are you with me? The first thing is understanding the will of God. Ephesians 5, 17 says it this way. Don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, again, some, some people, a lot of the church world will say, well, you, it's too high. God's will is too high. It's too lofty. You can't really understand the will of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. He gave us the written word. He, we have 66 books full of his will. And we have the author of this living on the inside of it, inside of each of us that are believers to to guide us into that truth, to really unveil it to us. And he's a master counselor. He can get by your brokenness and your dysfunction and the way you were raised and the experiences that you responded to that brought you to be who and what you are today. He's a counselor, man. He'll walk you right out of dysfunction into beautiful emotional wholeness. Maturity the way it should be. He'll do it. He'll do it. Can you shout, he'll do it. Glory be to God. 
See, knowing his will is possible, we have a responsibility as well as the opportunity to understand it. Why? Because we, we'll see that in a minute, but in 1 John 5, 4, 14, it says this, if we ask anything according to his will, there's that word anything again, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. This is the confidence that we have concerning him. If we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petition that we've asked of him. Even before we see it. Even before we taste it or feel it or wear it or spend it. What are we talking about? How to receive anything. Asking is important. But before asking is understanding his will. Like we said last week, people would say, well, God, what college? Father, what college do you want me to go to? The question should be not what college, but Father, do you want me to go to college? You know, do you want me to do that? What's your will for my life? Let me just throw this in here. John seven seventeen. Jesus said, if any man will do his will, he'll know whether my teaching is from heaven or not. I want you to understand that in order to recognize the will of God, you need to, first of all, be willing to do it. And God knows whether you are or not. And when, you, and when God reveals His will to you, that's when you're going to find out whether you truly are or not. Because a lot of times we're real, oh, God, oh, God, in that moment of consecration when praise and worship is so good or when the anointing, oh, God, whatever that moment of prayer where you're right there, you know, you're on the floor or whatever. You're just whatever, God, just whatever you want me to do. And then a week later, God shows you and think, ah. Uh, <laughs> well, how about it? <laughs> Someone said it this way, that you know how on a radio station that say, well, they're not broadcasting today. Well, you have to tune it in. You know, hear a certain program or something. Boy, I'm an old school guy. Look at me turning the knob to tune it in. You have to tune it in. <laughs> well, God's will for your life, you'll find it on the willing band. Not AM, AM or FM or satellite radio. You'll hear God speaking to you, God's voice to you of His will for your life. You'll find it on the willing band. That is, when you become willing to do it before you know it, that's when He will begin to speak to you about what that is. Now, Young's literal translation says, because of this, become not fools, but understanding what is the will of the Lord. In other words, don't be wobbled. You don't have to wobble around. Don't have to fail. Don't have to run around confessing things, confessing, 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 and not receiving because you didn't know it wasn't His will for you in the first place. You know, and you get, you get past that, that embarrassment of praying and telling everybody you're going to have something, and then it never comes. You get past that, you avoid that by finding out, first of all, if it's His will for you. And then when you find out, and you do that by getting in His Word. He gave us His Word. He gave us ministers. My goodness, you can find some wonderful ministries online. Be careful, because some of them will get you confused. But, but if you're willing, God will guide your heart. You know, always be in church, hear the Word, stick with the pastors, stick with the people that you know that God has connected you with in life to bring the Word to you. Amen? Remember, we're sheep, and the church is a, sh a sheepfold, and, and a pastor is a shepherd. That whole, that whole metaphorical picture is for your preservation and safety and prosperity. So... Feed on the Word, read the Word, hear the Word, be in church where you need to be, and when you're here, be here. Amen. Don't be planning this afternoon and, and all that kind of stuff. And I know our minds drift. That's why I put commercials in now and then. Did you hear the one about? No, I'm not going to tell you that. 
My dad always used to start out with, he said, did you hear the joke about the airplane? Nah, it's over your head. <laughs> Ephesians 5.17 says that in the Amplified Bible, therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Don't be vague. Don't just be wandering around. You know, don't just be like a hunter wondering if, you know, going out, well, if a, if a turkey happens to jump in front of my gun, you know, and the trigger happens to go off, or if a deer does, or a pheasant, or a rabbit, what are you hunting for? Well, just whatever God's will is, it doesn't work that way. Don't be like a person, go wandering out to grocery store, you're pushing the cart up and down the aisle, just hoping... Well, God's in heaven, whatever he throws into the cart. I mean, that's as silly as somebody who was given in the offering. The guys, a bunch of guys at work were talking about how they gave in charity and the offering. And, and they were talking about, you know, well, this guy tithes and, and says, well, how do you give, Joe? He said, well, I'll tell you what I do. God is almighty. He's in heaven. He's powerful. I just take whatever comes in, get it in cash, throw it up in the air. He takes whatever he wants and whatever comes back down, I keep. Don't be wandering around the grocery grocery aisle of prayer. Think, well, well, what do you what do you want? Well, just whatever God's will is. Well, what is God's will? I don't know. Well, what do you want? God wants you to have a preference. Why? Because see, it doesn't just stop with you. He wants you to have a preference because He's got a design for your life. He's got a mission. You're here on purpose. And there's people out there, there's people you're going to influence. There's people you're going to contact, people you're going to bless. There's things that need to come into your life so you have them in your life as tools or resources when you come into those places of relationship and connection that he's got you destined for. And so in order to have those things, you need to identify them. Walk with the Lord. Walk closely with Him. Find out what His will is for your life, and then you pray. How to receive anything. Once you know the will of God, then you pray with confidence. With confidence, knowing that when you pray, you're not twisting His arm. You're simply coming to Him and presenting a requisition without qualms to your Heavenly Father who desires, who longs to distribute His goods to His kids. Hallelujah. That's what the word ask means. It's to, be, to present a requisition to Him whose items He longs to distribute. James 1, 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and doesn't chew you out for asking, doesn't make fun of you for asking, but let him ask in faith. Ask in faith. Ask with confidence. What's that mean? It means to ask in the confidence that you're going to receive what you asked for when you prayed. That when you prayed, it was going to be granted to you right then. Before you see it, before you feel it, before you experience it. I'm talking to you about how to receive anything. How do you, how can you pray with that? See, this is what separates us probably the, from many, many Christians in the body of Christ. I was told there was a pastor in town that taught his people to go ahead and pray, but don't really have an expectation of the outcome. Can you understand how that is not praying in faith? Jesus is teaching us, when you pray, expect it. Expect what? Expect what you ask for. Connect with God, your Father, and, ex and receive it. You receive it right then. You believe it's granted to you right then. Are you following me? 
how can I pray with that kind of confidence, Pastor? It's because you've done the groundwork ahead of time of understanding what His will is. You're not trying to talk Him into anything. You're here. He's in heaven. This is how it gets to us. We receive it. So many people, so many of us, are living below God's will for our lives simply because we're not receiving yet what He's provided. And He wants you to have it. He wants us to have it. And we can have it. All things are possible with Him. And we can have it because all things are possible to Him who believes. So we want to get involved in believing, right? We want to reach out and receive those wonderful things that God has provided. How can you ask and pray like that? It's because you've done the groundwork. Look with me at John 15. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you abide in me, John 15, verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Verse 8 says, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. This is how God gets glory, that you bear much fruit. Oh, man, I've been around people who, wealthy people, but you'd never know it in their community. You'd never know they had anything. And there is a degree of, of righteous modesty in that, not just flaunting your good fortune. There is a a degree of righteousness in that. But I'm talking about the fact that you don't want anybody to know you have anything because that's how they keep score in town. The person with the least wins. Or at least the person who acts the most humble gets the most glory. Can you see how quirky that is? But here we read from the lips of Jesus that when you ask and receive because he's, you're living in him and he's living in you and you ask for your, what you will to have, he gets glorified. If you abide in me, And my words abide in you. You'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. What's that fruit? It's not the fruit of the Spirit. It's stuff. It's answers to prayer. It's healings for people. It's works going forward. It's things working out for you. It's relationships restored. It's jobs It's clothes. It's help for other people. It's the move of God in other towns and in our towns and right here in the church. Help. Are you with me, church? Listen to what he says. If you live in me, if you abide in me, abide means to dwell or to live, not just to visit, but to live there. If you live in me and my words live in you, what an invitation. Come on, church. Come on, believers. If, if we identify ourselves, if we see ourselves as the people in Christ that he's made us, the new creature, the child of God, the redeemed, the forgiven, the blessed, the holy, the changed, the accepted and loved, if we live there, If we live in union with him instead of the old person we used to be, if we let that old identity be washed away and we identify with who we really are, adopt that new identity and live in him and his words live in us, wow. In that place, we'll ask for what we will and it'll be done. Why? Why? Because when you love somebody, 
when you're living in union with Jesus, His words, you've heard what His will is. You've listened. You've come to understand it. You're in a relationship with Him. It's not religion. It's not a formula. Stay with me for a moment. You remember back in middle school, some of you remember that. Middle school, junior high. You found out somebody liked you and you liked somebody. and You started passing notes. Anybody remember passing notes? Now we got a text. My dad always told me about notes. He said, you're hearing a lot about my dad this morning. He always said, don't ever put anything in writing you don't want everybody to read. <laughs> That's still good wisdom on Facebook and every place else. It just, it's going to stay forever. But, oh, what a joy it was. You know, she likes me. She likes me. What kind of clone do you wear? I wear brute. <laughs> That'll date me, man. <laughs> Ah, oh, the notes, you know, and getting them back there. You, you share a desk and you slip them in your desk. You can find them the next period. Or Listen, how many of us, what I'm saying to you is when you love somebody, their words are important to you. Why do we? Maybe you don't. I keep all the birthday cards. I keep the birthday cards. I keep the anniversary cards that... that the joy gives me. Why do I do that? Because her words are more precious to me than any other person's words on the face of the earth. I love her. She loves me. So when Jesus said, if you live in me and my words live in you, that really kind of is a litmus test that shows us how much we really love the Lord. How precious are His words to you today? Hallelujah. Just a couple more verses. Can you take two more? All right, then we're going to be baptizing. John 14, verse 31. Jesus said, But the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Let us go to the cross. Why did Jesus go to the cross? I want you to understand that Jesus is going to the cross was an expression of his love for the Father. He'd heard the Father's words. He loves the Father. So he went to the cross. In John 14, verse 12, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I want you to understand this word do. You remember that Jesus is the creator, the one who made everything in the beginning, the one who made us. This word do, the Greek tells us, means to adopt a way of expressing by act the thoughts and feelings. It stands for a number of such acts, chiefly to make, to produce, to create, to cause. P.C. Nelson was a, great, a Greek scholar. He, only, he learned 27, he knew 27 languages. Matter of fact, he wrote the, the, the doctrine book that we use in our Bible school. He was a Greek scholar, and of this verse, he said this Jesus is saying this If you ask anything in my name, if I don't have it, I'll make it for you. These are the words of Jesus. Are we, are we swallowing the word of God this morning? Let's do that. Let's let his words 
Begin to drag down the unbelief. Replace the unbelief. Let's let his words begin to inspire hope and, and confidence and curiosity and pursuit of his will for our life. One last one, John 16, verse 23 Speaking of the day in which you and I live right now, Jesus said this, and in that day, you will ask me nothing. In other words, we won't ask him for anything. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask. Can you all say ask? Ask, and you will receive that your joy might be full. Who said you'll receive? Was it Pastor Lauren? Well, I did right now, but I'm quoting Jesus. Jesus said, say it with me. Jesus said, if I ask, I will receive, and my joy will be full. Oh, glory to God. So what are you waiting for? Why don't you ask? Why don't we ask? This week, why don't we get into the Word of God, find out what His will of God, is, what His will is for us. Again, not just for our life, but in the communities in which we live. He, so, that, so that through us, He can, we, he can bring, bring the changes that we so long to see in our lives and in the lives of other people. Glory be to God. He came. Jesus came. He lived. He died. He was raised from the dead because everything necessary for your forgiveness and your reconciliation to God as his children was complete. And whoever calls on his name will be delivered, will be forgiven, will be saved, preserved, come into a place with God as their father where they have provision, they have peace, all those things. How many of you believers would, could, could testify right now saying, I've been to a place, I've been in a place, and I turned my life over to the Lord, I received Jesus as my Savior, and He's come into my life, and He's being to me all those things that you've been talking about, Pastor. Could you raise your hand and wave it around? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Why don't we lift our voice and thank Him for that. Father, we thank You. Thank You for Your Word that feeds us. Thank You for Your testimonies in this place, Your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can put, that down, put those down. Now, I would like to... I don't want to just preach this and not give you an opportunity to connect with it, to receive Jesus for yourself. If you're here today, I tell you what, let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, if you will. You're here today, you see, and you're, you're listening to me, you're online, you're listening to the word that's been coming forth. It's resonating on the inside of you, and, and in your heart, you're, you're wanting to connect with God you're one to get into that relationship with him. And you can do that, like I'm talking about, by receiving Jesus as Lord. He said, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth he's Lord, you will be saved. You'll come right into that relationship with him. So we're going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to lead the whole congregation in a prayer. And if, you're, if I'm talking to you right now, you say, I, wanna, I want that, Pastor. I believe what you're saying. I want to receive that right now. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord. On the count of three, would you raise your hand so I know I'm praying with you while we're all praying together? One, two, three. Go ahead and lift your hand all over the room. I'm receiving Jesus as my Lord. Great, 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 great. All right, everybody, let's pray this together. Say it with me. Dear God in heaven, right now, I do believe that what you've, what you've said about Jesus. I believe he's alive and he's Lord. So I give you my life, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
for saving me. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate with those? Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a couple things that I would like you to do. Hit the subscribe button, rate, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to invest in helping us reach more people for Christ, head over to mywordoflife.church and click the online giving button. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you again next time.